Alrighty team, before we get started, I just want to take the opportunity to genuinely thank every single one of you for being here. The role that the health and safety rep plays in your workplace is absolutely critical. And for someone like me as an inspector, my substantive role was as an inspector, I'm only acting in the manager's position. Speaking with HSRs in their workplace when they're available gives me an idea about the actual hazards, tells me what's actually happening at the coalface. Um, you're abs uh, I was absolutely correct, you have no duty. This is a voluntary thing. Most of you are doing it for love. You don't get paid anymore. You're not getting heaps of overtime to do this gig. You're doing it because you're passionate about health and safety. So thank you, every single one of you, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to pay my respects um, and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, elders past and present on which this meeting takes place. Uh, always was their land, always will be. Got a few acronyms and things to get through. Most of them you'll know. The widget's a bit of a weird one. I think it's a Victorian thing that I picked up. Um, so my background is as an inspector in Victoria for a few years before moving to Western Australia. Um, but I'm a West Australian boy born and bred, so don't hate me for coming from over east. <laughs> um, I've been doing this job for about four years now. Uh, so I've been an inspector total eight, nearly nine years. Um, widget, just a placeholder name for a unnamed, unspecified manufactured good. That will become apparent as we go through because we're going to do a couple of little activities that you'll hopefully get some practical skills to take away. All right. I think the most important part about dealing with consultation is what's reasonably practicable. I don't know that it's really discussed in a whole lot of context. Um, it really, it's got to be commensurate with the issue that you're dealing with. So if it's a PPE issue, it's deciding what sort of safety boots, what sort of um, you know, high-vis vest you're going to wear, that may be really critical in your industry, it may not be. So the level of consultation needs to involve the HSRs if there's one elected, but it doesn't need to go for months and months and months. We should be able to make a pretty timely decision about that. If we're looking at violence and aggression and implementing systems for managing things like children in child protection and looking at the trauma-informed care and how we reduce trauma to our child protection workers, that might be a much, much longer piece of consultation. We'd want to involve as many people as possible. It may involve other per, uh, PCBUs. It may not just involve the child protection workers at one house. So. Just keeping that in mind, when we're looking at consultation through an inspector's lens, I want to see that it's happening as so far as is reasonably practicable. They're engaging with you. They're engaging you in the process. If a PCB is not engaging workers in the process, number one, the outcome's going to be terrible. Right? Who wants to do something that they haven't had a say in? I certainly don't. You probably won't either. Um, and there may be a, um, a view for an inspector to take enforcement action. Before we get to that point though, I would hope that the HSRs have had an ability to say, hey listen, you probably should involve us in this, and if, if not, consider writing a PIN or calling WorkSafe. Um, I deal with the vast majority of PINs in our organisation. Um, it's super fun, I really enjoy it. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's never emotive, people are never upset by the time I get there. Um, and I think it's really, really important to remember that the reason that people get upset is because of the passion that you've all got for the job that you do. If you don't feel heard, you don't feel acknowledged, you don't feel involved, of course you're going to be pissed off, I would be too. So keeping that in mind, when we're dealing with consultation, when we're writing pins, let's try to take the emotion out of it. Yeah, it can be really difficult. Let's be objective, use objective language. Number one, it makes my job easier to confirm your pin and say, yep, they've done a great job here. They haven't called, called old, mate, old mate a dickhead. Um, and I've seen that in a pin. Someone's called a dickhead, not here in Victoria, thankfully. Um, I've also seen people attack workers, attack their managers, attack their site managers in these pins. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. Your personal views, whether I agree with them or not, don't make a pin that I can confirm, okay? Um, now look, I've got some stuff in here about the explanatory memorandum. I don't know if anybody's going to be interested in, um, in me talking legalese, but basically um, when the drafters wrote this and they, and they um, provided the explanatory memorandum, they talked about how important HSRs are, how important it is to consult with workers. It's not just a few words that have been written. The intent behind it, Parliament wanted you to have a say. They understand how valuable your insights are. Put your hands up if you feel like you consult effectively in your workplace. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, I think, yeah, probably need this session then, yeah? Um, that's really sad, um, but not surprising if I'm honest. Um, how many of you are from large government organisations? 
many of you have met your director general? How many of you get to see your, like your boss's boss regularly? How many of you get to raise concerns to those people regularly? Yeah, you see that? The number of hands just goes down and down and down. Um, look, obviously, you're not going to have a chance to meet with the DG every other day. Um, they're busy, they've got a lot to work on. Um, and, you know, do you really want to? Maybe not. You've got your own work to do as well. But I think um, it's a bit of a sad state of affairs when we can't say that, yeah, I've had an opportunity to raise issues. So. We've got a number of systems, particularly in government, but if you're not in government, I hope your own private organisation has got their own, to write hazards, to submit hazard reports. Like um, the amount of PCBUs that have come across that are concerned that people are lodging hazards, now that's what it exists for. That's why it's there. What's the worst that happens? Nothing bad happens after you've submitted a hazard, right? It just brings people's attention to issues in the workplace. So if somebody's upset about it, and say, oh, we don't want that hazard, it looks bad on our end of year report, well, do you not think the injury that might come from that hazard is probably going to look worse? Like, I think more hazards and less injuries is where we want to be, yeah? So, there's three key pillars. It's consult, cooperate, and coordinate. Now, the cooperate and coordinate part is not just for workers in the PCBU or HSRs in the PCBU. It also involves other PCBUs as well. So, most government agencies will have a fair amount of interaction with other PCBUs, whether they're government or whether they're um, just, you know, contractors. We want to try to make sure that our health and safety processes align and that, you know, I'm not doing A and you're doing B and then we end up injured somehow or, you know, something catastrophic happens. The intent is that we're all on the same page. If we all know what each other are doing, the chances of something going wrong well, I guess it could be really, really high if it's a terrible plan, but the intent is that it's really, really low, that we know what's going on, we're all on the same page. My little pictograms there, enjoy those. Um, it's legislated for a reason. It's, it's really, out of any piece, any section, any regulation, any piece of legislation that deals with work health and safety, consultation is the key pillar. If we can't get that right, how do we get anything else right? I've been banging my drum about this since I got here. I'll continue banging it until the day I die. It is the most critical element of our legislation. So, PCBU to worker duty. This is kind of what it should look like uh, when we're making a change or discussing changes uh, to things that affect our work health and safety. Hands up if that flow chart is something that you've experienced. get everybody's workplaces after this. <laughs> so, look, let's take it to something really, really simple. Um, because if I talk about psychosocial hazards, I'll be here for three hours and I'll take over the whole day and I'm not going to do that. Um, let's have a look at changing a manual task um, in a workplace. And we've got a bit of an exercise about this later. Say your employer or PCBU has said, ah, we want to stop getting 100 bags of 1,000 widgets. We want 100 bags of 10,000 widgets. Okay, on paper, it probably doesn't seem that bad, but if your process, your whole job is to unload those bags and process those widgets, you're going to probably be exposed to an increased manual task risk. So what ideally should happen is the PCB goes, hey team, I want to change how many widgets we get in a bag. And you go, okay, cool, how many do you want? Oh, 10,000, but we're not giving you any other equipment to do it. That's a bad idea, boss. <laughs> we might get hurt doing that. Um, how about we get an extra forklift or how about we get some more manual task equipment or how about we consider going to a different producer so we can get lower cost for the same like the same amount of widgets that we're getting now do you know what i don't think the last idea is really possible but yeah we can certainly get some forklifts we can get some additional things in place we can maybe look at the way that the workplace is set up um and you know what that's what we're going to do it just that was a, it just flowed through there. Really, really simple. It's it's not rocket science, and it doesn't need to be. If the issue is more complex, the consultation is going to be more complex. But essentially, you get told there's a thing that wants to be changed. All right, you express your views, you raise your issues, you're included in the decision making process, and your views are considered and you're advised of the outcome. It doesn't mean agreement. We're not always going to agree. Yeah, consultation doesn't mean agreement. Um, It'd be nice if we could agree on everything, but it's not a perfect world. But as long as a PCBU can demonstrate that they've done that, and to demonstrate it, it's not just they're telling me, I want to see some pretty solid evidence. All right, how many meetings have you had? How did you consider their views? Not, yes, we've considered your views, it's a bad idea. How? 
what part of it is a bad idea? What part of it's a good idea? Is there a compromise? I want to see genuine, meaningful consultation at these workplaces. There we go, we'll go again. That's how important it is. All right. So when is consultation required? I'm not going to read through every single dot point up there. I'm going to make the presentation available for people afterwards. Um, I'll send it out in an email so you can go through the points. But I mean, at its core, a change to a health and safety thing that's going to affect your health and safety, not something that is very unlikely to affect your health and safety, but it's likely to affect your health and safety. And as HSRs for work groups, it needs to be relevant to your work group. Okay, so if you are a, um, I don't know, a, a prison officer and, and the change is going to affect one of the like office worker areas and it has no impact on you, they don't need to consult with you about that, but they do need to consult with that whole office area. Um, if you're a truck driver and they're going to start changing the seats and you know, monitoring things in, in the truck, yeah, they should talk to you about that, but they don't need to talk to everybody else that's not involved. It's going to be work group specific. And the reason that work groups are fantastic is that you've got people that understand the work that you do. Um, I can't imagine how horrible it would have been from 1984 to now, having to try to explain to people, this is what I do for a job, to get somebody to listen, to understand. Now, hopefully, that's not happening. Now, hopefully, you've got an HSR that understands. They are, oh, I know what you do for a job, cool. You don't have to explain the rest of it. You can get straight to the nuts and bolts. Oh, okay, again, what have I done here? Sorry. Uh-oh. Yeah, okay, yep. At least they're not star fades in and appear. Okay, so we've sort of talked about this already. Hands up if you think you have a duty to the PCBU. Hands up if you felt like you've had a duty to the PCBU. Hands up if you've been directed to do work as an HSR. Yeah. I'm really pleased that there's not that many hands going up. I was kind of expecting the opposite. Um, look, section 70 talks about the PCBU to HSR duty. They've got a whole bunch of obligations there. Um, you have zero, zero obligations to the PCBU. You're doing this out of love. And it's such a critical role, and I don't want anyone to stop doing what they're doing. But you've got your own workload to manage, and the PCBU certainly has to provide reasonable time. But we know in the public sector, resourcing is a struggle. So please consider your health and safety, your own health and safety, before you start running into bat for everybody else. Um, but you have no duty to them. Um, historically, I've seen HSRs used as pseudo WHS coordinators, free labour. Um, I, don't, I don't want to say that. I want you to be involved in investigations. I want you to be involved in risk assessments. I want you to be involved in consultation. I don't want you being directed to go investigate an incident and then ex expected to fix it. It's not, not what you're there for from a five day training course. It's unfair. It's unfair to do that to you. All right, I have um, stolen the next slide from Comcare. I hope they don't mind. And this is going to lead us into pins. This flowchart, which I've, um, I've fixed because it was not totally accurate for Western Australia, it sort of sets out when you should consider issuing a pin. Um, and each circumstance is going to be different. But it's really, have you reasonably tried to fix the issue? We're not sliding slips of paper under doors, which happens. Um, we're not sending emails back and forth, um, vigorously attacking each other's point of view. If we can sit down in a room, or at worst on the phone or Teams, like let's just talk to each other and not send a thousand emails back and forth, it's not effective. And I get there's gonna be a lot of PCBs that say, oh, it's not reasonable for us to sit in a room and talk about it. Well, if the issue is serious enough, yeah, it is. At least by Teams, let's have a conversation. That's practicable. Um, and you can't have your words taken out of context then. But essentially, this is what I would like to see before going out to review a pin, um, which feels like an every other week job, to be honest. Um, and I'd say 100% of the time so far, every single pin that's been issued has been doing a breakdown of communication. 
most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, people acknowledge there's an issue. The person that's got the pin feels personally attacked for whatever reason. Um, maybe it's the way the pin was given to them. Maybe it's their own insecurities. I don't know. But this is supposed to be a tool for collaboration and consultation. The Robin style of legislation is supposed to mean that the regulator is the last point of contact. We're not supposed to be coming out to fix all the problems. The problems are supposed to be getting fixed internally. We want workplaces to regulate themselves. That's why HSR's got the power to issue pins and cease work. Right? That's what we've tried to, that balance of power is slowly trying to become more even. It'll never be 50-50. There's a reason that you can't be directed to do things, right? We want HSRs to be impartial, to fulfill their function and role without being told what to do by the PCBU. I'll get off my soapbox shortly, I promise. All right. The number one pet hate of mine when I look at a pin is that the legal entity has not been identified correctly. It's the site manager has been referenced as the PCBU or the officer. I only deal with government usually, so that's always wrong. That's, that's not the, the correct legal entity. If you work in a different environment um, that isn't public sector, it's usually the person who pays you. If you're a HSR for a work group, um, nine times out of 10 it's gonna be the person that pays you. Keeping in mind, you can't issue pins to people that aren't in your work group. So you can't go and issue a pin to somebody like another organisation, don't do that. Like, get their HSR to do that if they've got one. If not, I suppose you can call us. Uh, we can come out and sort it out. But we want consultation to occur. But the PIN, this power, is it's really limited to your work group. There are provisions where, you, where it can be, oh, you can do it to somebody else's work group. But that's only when they don't have a HSR through the available. Yeah? Now, four common types of legal entity. I'm going to go a bit legalese on you. Have a look at your pay slip, find out who pays you. That's probably the person conducting the business or under, undertaking, usually. If you write them and their legal entity correctly at the issue two part in the pin, you'll make me a very happy man. Most times in state government, it's gonna be the state of Western Australia, responsible agency, department of blah, blah. Um, but sometimes it'll be a company. It's never the ABN. Don't write the ABN in, it's not a legal entity, it's just a trading name. There's something behind that, it's a trust, it's a sole trader, it's a partnership. If you're having dramas, you can call the, work, the call centre um, and I'll probably get a phone call to talk to you. Um, but if you're getting stuck, you can always call us. You can call your union, ask them, they might know. Um, you know go talk to other HSRs, try to work out the problem yourselves. But please, if you get nothing else out of today, Identify the correct legal entity on your pins. Oh, and I've done it again. Very bad. All right. Put your hands up if you've written a pin. Put your hands up if it's been reviewed by a WorkSafe inspector. Okay. That tells me either two things. One, you're writing very, very good pins and we never get involved. Um, or two, uh, you're not writing pins because you don't feel comfortable to do that. I've not done the HSR training, so I don't know what you get taught um, in those classes, but you need to identify the elements of the alleged contravention. So what do I mean by elements? It's the part of the section of legislation that you're using that talks to what the problem is, and you have to address all of them. So we're gonna do a section 19 breach in a little bit, the primary duty of care. And we're gonna go through, these are the really critical pieces that you have to include. Um, and if you don't include any of them, it might make your pin invalid. Uh, now, I know our legislation talks about a pin's not gonna be invalid solely for technical reasons, and that, that is true. But if you don't identify that, you know, the contravention is happening at your workplace, if you don't identify that workers are at risk, um, if you don't identify that, you know, the person who has the primary duty of care has failed to do something, it's gonna be really difficult for someone like me to confirm it. So when does a hazard or risk equal a contravention? Well, it's when people are exposed to a risk of injury from that. And the PCBU hasn't, so far as is reasonably practicable, controlled exposure to the risk of injury from that hazard. All right, so, if you're gonna write a pin, here's some things to consider. 
Are there any contentious elements? They're the things you need to focus on. Is it a million dollar control for a $10 injury? Or is it a million dollar control for a few hundred thousand $10 injuries? Cost is the least, like the bottom of the rung for us to consider, right? I, I don't usually take into consideration cost unless it's grossly disproportionate. But the PCBU, when they look to challenge the notice, that's the first thing that they'll go to. Think about it. Like, you don't have to write anything in your pin about it. It's not contentious, but if it is contentious, you know, and you think, oh, do you know what? I think it's practicable because I've seen it happen at this workplace down the road, include it. Deal with the contentious parts. <laughs> the easy parts, I'm not going to pick up and go, oh, yeah, no worries. I'm going to pull you apart because you haven't identified the PCBU in your basis for belief. Well, you've identified it at the top. You've said it's the state of Western Australia, whatever. That's probably going to be okay for me. But if you haven't put in anything in there and the PCBU says, look, we want to do this thing, but it's five million bucks and we haven't had any injuries, there's no hazards been raised about it, they've written a pin on this thing, they haven't come and talked to us about it, it's going to be difficult for me to really confirm that pin. <coughs> um, now, we're going to deal with reasonably practicable and the elements of that in a little bit, but there's no single determinative factor when we're looking at writing like taking enforcement action. You're essentially getting a bastardised version of the information I give to inspectors when, I'm, when we're doing uh, improvement notice writing. Um, I don't want you to think, oh, I haven't quite, there's, there's just not enough in the, in the cost part, like, you know, it's gonna cost too much. If all the other things line up, if there's a hazard, a really significant hazard, if there are available controls, if it's likely to occur and the PCBU should know how to control that thing, don't, don't worry about cost. But if the likelihood is zero to one percent and cost is in the millions, maybe that's something to consider. Now, so elements. What have I just done there? It's a laser pointer. As they start coming up, you'll start to see what I mean. We're breaking down this section 19. So, we've got a person conducting a business or undertaking must ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, the health and safety of workers engaged or caused to be engaged by the person, and workers whose activities in carrying out work are influenced or directed by the person, while the workers are at work in the business or undertaking. It's a whole lot of legalese, but basically, does your employer, does your PCBU, have they ensured so far as is reasonably practicable that you're safe at work? And what happens if we take away the at work bit. Can't write a pin now, can you? If you're not at work, and I'm not talking you're working from home, if you're at home, you're just at home, and you're not at the workplace, how can you form a reasonable belief that there's a contravention? Is the hazard exposing people who are working in the workplace to a hazard? Every single one of these elements is really critical for you to get right. And, the secret element, my favorite of all time, reasonably practicable. I'm gonna give you a acronym, it's just a learning device. Um, don't hate me for putting costs up the top. Uh, the only reason I do it is because the acronym doesn't work otherwise. You'll start seeing it soon, if I can click through it fast enough. The acronym is CHALK. Remember, really, really simple, CHALK. Cost, yes, least determinative factor, but it doesn't work otherwise, so please don't hate me. But what's the hazard? What's the risk of harm? What controls are available to eliminate or min uh, minimise the risk? Again, likelihood. What's the likelihood at? If it's like 2%, but the risk of death is like 100%, then yeah, maybe, maybe we look at doing something about that. But if it's, you know, again, the $10 injury for a 1% chance of injury, is it something that is likely to happen? Uh, and what should the person know? When we say what should the person know, what should the business or undertaking know? Do they know that it's a hazard? This is why your hazard reporting systems are so critical. If you don't report, they're not gonna know. They probably should know, they should be going out and doing, being proactive and there's a whole range of employer organisations that exist that most PCBUs are probably a part of. But realistically, if they don't, if you haven't raised them with, raised the issue with them, 
before you've written the PIN, I'm probably not going to think you've consulted. So, you know, we need to make sure that we're having really meaningful consultation with the PCV before writing a PIN. And if you're going to write something that has the term reasonably practicable in it, really read the provision before you write a PIN on a particular section. Go to section 18, look at reasonably practicable. If you remember nothing else, chalk. It's really straightforward. Oh, and I'm going the wrong way. Everything's going smoothly, I'm fine. I've got my security in the corner, they're taking care of me. Um, all right, reasonable belief, not beyond all reasonable doubt. So as a HSR, when you form a reasonable belief, it's what somebody else in your shoes would you'd think they'd think. It's not really that difficult, it's just a reasonable person. They used to use a term, the man on the clap and tram. I think it's a bit old school myself, but um, it just really made, what, what does everyone else think? Would they have a similar opinion to you if they were in your shoes seeing the same thing, doing the same job? And how, like, these questions in here, what do you know about the issue? How do you know it? How did you become aware? Did you see it or did somebody else tell you? Is it third-hand information? I know that there's a lot of people out there that get given a whole heap of information that's third-hand from other people and you go in best interest to write a pin because you think this is a real big issue and then it turns out that none, none of the things are totally correct and your pin gets cancelled and you feel shit because you've written a pin in good faith and it's been cancelled by an inspector. Um, so really critical to ask, what do I know? How do I know it? What supporting information or evidence do I have? It doesn't need to be much. It could just be a policy procedure. It could be physically seeing a thing. It could be a photo. It could be a video. Um, just uh, my advice to you is don't take somebody else's word for it. Go see it for yourself. Um, now, what were you told? Are there conflicting views? There's always conflicting views in a workplace about particular issues, don't get me wrong, but if it's a pretty straightforward hazard, are there conflicting views about it? Well, why? Why are there conflicting views about it? It's really worth exploring these things. How do you give weight to what you've been told? That's um, it's really going to be up to you as the individual. If you've been told if, look, psychosocial hazards, we know that we pretty much can't see any of them. Um, we know violence occurs, um, we know that people get bullied, we know that bad things happen in workplaces that affect people's mental health, but most of the time it's invisible. So in those circumstances, how do you weigh up the information you've been told? You could just do it, I've been told by 10 people this thing and five people the other, so I'll go with the 10, but ultimately it's up to you to decide which information you think is true. And you do what you, you do the best you can. And if it gets challenged, someone like me comes out. And if your pin gets cancelled, don't feel bad. I have improvement notices cancelled. Shit happens. I just want to make sure that it's the safety outcome. Safety outcome is the most paramount thing. All right. So um, when we're talking about linking your observations to the elements of the, the alleged contravention, it's really breaking it down to these three critical things. What's the thing that you saw? Why is it wrong? And how does the like how has the PCBU failed in their duty? Or how has the provision been contravened? I saw a large pit with no barricading or no air protection. Workers and people are walking nearby and they could fall in, and if they did, there's spikes at the bottom of the pit and everybody's gonna die. You're probably gonna do a cease work for that one, so let's just say no spikes and you're gonna break your leg. You failed to ensure, as far as is reasonably practicable, that to protect workers and other people from falling into the pit. Like, it's really straightforward, isn't it? When you break it down to the three simple elements, what have you seen, why is it wrong, and what should the PCB have done to fix it? I've got a couple of pin examples that um, are gonna be sent out so that you can have them, you can take them away. One's for violence and aggression, and one's for the manual task, the, uh, the widget manufacturer. Um, scenario and hopefully you can take those and hopefully they're not wrong <laughs> uh, but hopefully you can take those and they'll give you an example of what you can do. Uh, you would have noticed on a pin um, if you looked at the form contravention versus likely contravention. Oh god damn it every time every time is it happening now? It's contravention. Has it happened but stopped? Likely contravention. Are people climbing off the roof of a workplace and they're finishing work for the day, but you know they're going to go to another workplace and climb up on the roof the next day? It's likely contravention. Seems kind of counterintuitive because you think, well, they're going to, it's a contravention. They're going to do it again. It's 
It's not my book, I didn't write it. That's the way the, the lawyers like it. So make sure that you ask yourself a question. Is the thing happening now or has it stopped happening but you think it's gonna happen again? Very straightforward. Um, I'm hoping once we finish uh, that we've got plenty of time for questions and I can clarify anything if I've skipped over it. All right, tips for success. I've already talked about some of the weird and wonderful things I've seen in bins. Um, don't use emotive language. Don't conflate issues. One pin, one contravention. Uh, if it's a fall from height issue, just write in about the fall from height issue. Don't include any of the failing to consult stuff. Don't include any of the psychosocial hazards. One contravention, one pin. If you have more than one piece of legislation in there, I'll cancel the pin. Don't use case law in a pin. I've seen people referring, like to directly referring to common law cases in pins. Please don't do it. I can't confirm your pin. Yes, you're probably smarter than I am. Yes, you've probably read all these cases, but I, I, can't, I can't do anything with that. It's got to be a, a section of the WHS Act of Regulations. That's all we're empowered to take enforcement action under. Do be objective. Do try and think from different points of view. Some stuff you can't. Some stuff is so straightforward that there isn't another point of view. Oh, we, there's there's a pit, there's spikes. We're not gonna put edge protection up because we can't afford it. Well, that's a stupid point of view. Don't consider it. Um, but if we're looking at things that are really complex, like violence and aggression in the Department of Child Protection, people that work in that space, they want to do a good job. They want to provide a safe environment for kids. They wanna make sure those kids uh, you know, have their trauma dealt with. They want to provide a safe workplace for a safe home environment for them, but they also want a safe workplace and don't want to get punched in the mouth or screamed at or abused. Um, try and think from different points of view, and hopefully by doing that, you'll set the example for the PCBU. I would really like to say that they're going to go out there and set that example, but sometimes it's up to you. It's not fair, but that's the reality. Consult with other HSRs and workers. Don't go rogue. Don't do it because you might be wrong. And if you're wrong, I cancel the pin and you feel bad. I don't want you to feel bad. Go and talk to other people. Say, I've got this problem. Do you have this problem? Does anybody else have this problem? It's, you know, the core tenant, like I said, of this legislation is consultation. Go talk to other people. Um, definitely do right what you have perceived with your five senses. Try where you can not to take into account other people's views for writing a pin. Yes, you need to go talk to them and figure out what's going on, but try and see it yourself. If you can't, because like I said, psychosocial hazards can be challenging, try to have some ever like read a report, look at injury statistics, things like that. That can really, really help. Um, you don't have to provide compliance. You don't, you just don't. It's not a requirement, but it's really helpful. Um, if somebody tells me I've done something wrong and they don't tell me how to fix it, it can be really challenging and people at the coalface, if you're the ones that are doing this work and you do have an idea about what you can do to fix it, it's just a, it's a recommendation. They don't have to do it, but put it in there. Um, Cause maybe somebody like me comes along and goes, you know what, that's a really good idea. Maybe, yeah, I'm gonna make them do that. I try as hard as I can to talk to as many HSRs as possible when I go out to workplaces, but quite often, particularly schools, prisons, department of communities, People are out doing operational work and either don't want to come and speak to me because they haven't got the time so I know that their workload's going to increase. So I try to email or call later, but um, you know, if you can put information in there, it's going to be reviewed. It gives me an opportunity to go, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to support that. I think that's good. Um, definitely consider the compliance date. Um, don't just put in the, eight, the minimum eight days if you know it's going to take six months to fix, don't do it. Um, I might consider modifying the PIN um, and extending that compliance date, but be reasonable. Even if this issue has been banging around the halls for 12 months, um, eight days to fix a problem, it, it feels a little bit vindictive <laughs> quite often when I come out. So no, they, they've known about it for years, they should have fixed it. Yeah, they should have. They should have fixed it, but they haven't. It's gonna take longer than eight days to fix it. So just consider that. Um, don't write a pin if an inspector's already decided to issue or not issue an improvement notice. If it's an inspector not issuing an improvement notice and you think they should have, call us and say, I think they should have written an improvement notice. Don't write a pin because it'll be canceled just on that basis alone. And remember, if a pin gets canceled, it doesn't mean that the inspector doesn't look at the substantive issue. We still look at the issues. We still come out and look at it, but what I really want is if you can write good pins, the PCB hopefully will get these and go, okay, yeah, fair point, we'll do it. 
And we're left out of it totally. We shouldn't have to come in because I don't know everything about every single workplace. I just don't. And I might make a bad choice. I might tell you to do something that is silly. And because the PCVU thinks they have to do it, they, they implement it. Workplace safety is best managed by the people that know the job that they do. So yep, I can come out and I can do my job, but it's way better if you guys can do yours and get the PCB on board. All right, I think this next one's uh, hopefully not gonna take all that long so we can get some questions in. I'm not gonna read it all out to you. Uh, it's the widget scenario that I raised before. So, a pin for failing to consult. In a circumstance like this where a workplace has said, we're gonna change a thing and we're not gonna consult with you because it's a business decision and it's not health and safety related, but it clearly is, you'd probably be in pretty good stead to write a pin on failing to consult. So what does that look like? What do we need to address here? Well, is there a hazard? And is it gonna affect your health and safety? Well, in this circumstance, Sorry, is there a risk of injury emanating from a hazard and is it going to affect your health and safety? Well, if you put yourself in their shoes and you're one of the workers that have to unload the widgets, yeah, it is. Did the PCBU consult with you? No, they gave you information. They didn't give you a chance to provide your views. They didn't take into account your views. They didn't include you in the decision-making process. They said, nah, I'm not talking to you about this. It's not anything to do with you. All right, yeah, they failed to consult. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Um, so how do you write that? How do you write that pin? It's, it doesn't need to be war and peace. It can be, this is the hazard that we were told about. This is the new change. These are the hazard that, that the risk emanating from the hazard. It's what's going to hurt people. They told us that it was nothing to do with us, and we weren't going to consult with them. They failed in their duty to consult with the HSR, and you know we're going to give them three weeks to talk to us about it and work out well what things can we put in place to fix this problem. It's, it's really not that complicated. Um, I hope that we get some more guidance out on the website shortly. That gives you some more tools, um, because I don't know that we've put enough out there. Um, certainly there's a lot of people working very hard and providing more information. Um, and you can always call a duty inspector, um, and, and yeah, we'll do our best to, to take your calls. But um, like I said, you guys are the ones that are, and I keep saying guys, I apologize. You team, you are the ones that are out there that are doing the work. There's no way that I'm going to know more about your job than you. It's just impossible. Um, unless you're also an inspector, and even then most people know more about what we do than I do. So I really, really want to make sure that you understand that your role is voluntary, your role is critical, and it's you and the rest of the team that are going to be making the choices and influencing the work that's going to have improved health and safety outcomes, not me, you. All right. What am I looking at when I'm reviewing a pin? What genuine consultation has occurred? It's not slipped under the door of a manager and that's it. I wanna see that there's meeting minutes, people have had conversations, emails if necessary, but you know, genuinely, if I can get out to a workplace and both sides of the fence say, yeah, we've talked about it for ages, we just, you know, he, this, this person's not getting their way, we're not getting our way, so a pin was written. Okay, well, at least there's been some consultation that you've tried to hash out the issues. But too often do I go to a workplace where the email at 11.30 at night, the slip of paper on Friday Arvo before going off to the weekend slipped under the door, not genuine consultation. So I want to see that that's happened. Has the correct duty holder been identified? We've talked about that. Has the correct section or regulation been selected? Sally touched on this before. If it doesn't have a financial penalty under it, usually it's not going to be something you can write a pin about. The exception being the duties under the Act, where you'll see Section 19 doesn't have a penalty provision, but Category 1, 2, 3 offences and industrial manslaughter do have pretty big financial penalties. Means you can write up in about it. Does the basis for belief sufficiently explain the alleged contravention? I want to pick it up and understand what you mean. It's really that easy. I want to be able to read and go, oh yeah, I get it. Makes sense. Yeah, that could probably hurt someone. That sucks. I wouldn't want to work in a place that has that. Cool. Let's fix it. Um, I don't need war and peace. If you've got policies and procedures that sort of would help me understand it, you can reference those in there. Don't cut and paste the whole thing, please, because I hate reading it the best of times. But if you put the policy and procedure in there, I can consider that when I'm reviewing it. I go, oh, okay, they've pointed this out, cool. I can, I can consider that. Time frames, reasonable time frames. 
really, really important. Um, if it's so serious and imminent that it's going to cause really, really horrible injury and fatality, you've got other powers to deal with that. Um, make sure that you're giving people a reasonable time to fix something. And are the recommendations reasonable? Um, I had to review one recently where the recommendation was that WorkSafe come out to investigate every individual incident of bullying at this workplace. Well, it's probably, it's, I'll not do this anymore. <laughs> That's going to be too much for me to handle. But it's not reasonable. We're, we're the regulator. It needs to happen internally or you get an independent external party. Uh, make sure that you're making reasonable recommendations. Um, don't write pins that don't affect your work group. Don't do it. Your powers don't extend to it. If somebody has asked you for help and there's not another health and safety rep or deputy available from that work group, ask yourself, is it urgent? When are they back next? Like if the HSR for that work group is on deck the next day, can you wait? Have a chat with them about it. Don't get wound up, don't get spun up, don't get sent off to write pins for somebody else's cause. You've got your own work to do, form your own reasonable belief, talk to another HSR of the work group that the issue affects. It might be getting dealt with, okay? Um, don't write notices on offices. Don't do it, all right? It's, the PCBU's got the primary duty. If you think the superintendent, the school principal, the, the whatever is an officer, well, they're, they're probably not under our legislation, which means I'm going to have to cancel it. And uh, I don't know that I'm, I'd be all that full bottle writing a pin, uh, writing an improvement notice on uh, an officer right now. I'd want to go and talk to a bunch of different inspectors and, well, talk to Sally because she, she might get upset if I do something without letting her know first <laughs> when it's something that's that, that big a deal. But just don't do it. Don't identify individuals just unless they are the person conducting the business or undertaking. So, you know, Jack Smith is the person who pays you. Don't write the school principal. Don't write the house manager. Don't write the person that's in charge if, if they're not the person that's paying you. It's the person conducting the business or undertaking. They've got the primary duty. I don't want to cancel pins, by the way, team. I hate doing it. It's the least fun part of my job is going and sitting down with the HSR and going, I'm really sorry. I have to cancel your pin because it hasn't addressed all the things that I needed to address. It's awful, especially the same sad, angry look in their face every time. It's really, really heartbreaking. So if you can think about writing a really good pin first go around, number one, maybe the PCBU doesn't review it because it's really, really good. And number two, if they do, I can sit down and go, yeah, cool, they've done a great job here. I can confirm that pin and we can move on with life. All right, I put some guidance material up here. You'd be interested to see the Queensland Code of Practice for Managing Psychosocial Hazards. Um, they have a different hierarchy of control for managing um, psychosocial hazards in the workplace, but they've got a fantastic piece on consulting with workers for managing um, psychosocial hazards. I think it's really, really valuable. Um, it's obviously not binding. We can't use that in any of the enforcement action we take over here, but just as a read for a guide about, oh, this is maybe how we should be expected to be consulted about with that, I think it's really, really helpful. Um, Obviously our code of practice for consultation and our code of practice for psychosocial hazards, but the worker representation and participation guide has really clear, straightforward, nuts and bolts advice for HSRs. I think it's really worth having a look at. Um, obviously these are all hyperlinked. It'll get sent out to you at the end of the presentation. Um, and I think that's all for me. So it's question time, which I guess